I want to give um I want to give Mario and Dabarti as much time as possible for their conversation. So I thought we would get started. Uh, welcome back to the Townsend Center. We're nearing the end of our fall season, so I have only one forthcoming event to mention. Um, tomorrow, the novelist Valeria Luiselli, collaborating with the artist Leo Heilblum and Ricardo Giraldo, her sound team, they'll present uh, Echoes from the Borderlands, an experimental sound essay documenting the histories of violence against land and bodies in the US-Mexico borderlands. Luiselli is the author of Lost Children Archive Are you uh, and Tell Me How It Ends, an essay in 40 questions among other texts. Um, the screening of Echoes from the Borderlands will take place in the Mod Fife Room over in Wheeler Hall um, tomorrow, as I said, tomorrow, uh, starting at five o'clock. And that presentation is part of our life. It's the, it's the um, final installment in our Life of Sound series. Also today and tomorrow, uh, there's going to be a kind of um, looping 15 minute excerpt of that sound project with other materials playing at the Center for New Media and Audio Technology um, today until four and tomorrow from 10 to one. And the center is located at 1750 Art Street on Northside. So today we are pleased to host Mario Taylor, a professor in the departments of rhetoric, ancient Greek and Roman studies and comparative literature. Mario is here to discuss his new book, Greek Tragedy in a Global Crisis, Reading Through Pandemic Times. And joining Mario is Debarti Sanyal, a professor in the Department of French and director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Critical Inquiry. So that's it for, for now. Mario and Debarti, I'll turn things over to you. Great. Thanks, I'm really honored and delighted to be in conversation with you, Mario, today, my friend, my colleague to discuss um, this absolutely brilliant and capacious book that puts into resonance classical Greek tragedy and our pandemic times, but also beyond that um, resonance between Greek tragedy and our unfolding present. Um, Greek tragedy in a global crisis. Um, I have to say, I've been trying to find another word to describe the experience of reading this book. And the only word I can think of is this French weird word called ébouriffant. To be ébouriffé is to kind of be, say, in a car with a bracing wind and your hair gets all ah. This is a lecture ébouriffante. Um, <laughs> um, it really does, uh, it's a book that really bears the mark of your capacious thinking and critical imagination with really deep philological readings um, of classical texts that focus on the sonic as much as the semiotic. And your references create a real kind of network of um, echoes, speaking of Louisellian echoes, um, you know, where Blanchot jostles alongside Sophocles, Aeschylus is put into conversation with Edward Said's late style, Euripides alongside Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Valeria Luzelli alongside Toni Morrison, Niobe alongside Susan Cain, which I loved. Um, and in many ways, what you do, Mario, is offer us a theory of reading in which the ancient texts are infused with a viral quality that contaminates successive presence. The virality of this literature is also a virtuality insofar as classical tragedy is being reactualized, reanimated, and resensed, because you really have this vocabulary of the senses right, resensed in the moment of its reading, in the time of COVID, of course, but also in the long durée of racial capitalism, in the time of ecological catastrophe, in the time of war and occupation, since you um, also mentioned Ukraine. That's why I say that you put into resonance antiquity and the contemporary rather than make an argument for the classics special pertinence to today or to the pandemic crisis or to the multiple interlocking crises that we are um, experiencing. Um, throughout these pages, the COVID pandemic reveals the intersection of the virus as a fact and the virus as a figure. The literal disease of COVID crossed over, revealed and intensified the diseases of our social arrangements, poverty, racism, police violence, environmental degradation. Um, 
And I was thinking of um, Patricia Williams' um, description of the pandemic and of the George Floyd killing as this double helix of grief and despair. Um, and it's a double helix that you trace throughout your chapter, but you also, as we saw, this double helix also provoked, catapulted a certain kind of resistance and protest that you too map in your book in terms of the insurrectionary that is demanded uh, that, the, that the pandemic of uh, racial violence and the pandemic in its epidemiological sense demanded. So, um, so as, as you also I mean, threaded through your pages, you, you talk about how the epidemic um, exposed certain people more than others to the actual, um, you know, the, the structural epidemics exposed certain people to the actual epidemic more than others, sacrificing some people in the name of the greater common good. And you track this sacrificial logic really brilliantly in your chapter on Iphigenia and Aulis. So what you call reading pandemically in this book is actually a theory of reading and of relating to cool, in which we are contaminated by classical tragedy as virulently as classical tragedy itself bears the toxic charge of our present. I would say this is not a matter of literature serving as a guide or survival's manual to the pandemic. And here I'm contrasting the way you're treating this to the way Camus' The Play became such uh, a bestseller during the uh, pandemic because it was seen as a survivor's guide and life's manual. Um, this is not at all the kind of uh, logic that you are describing when you're putting, resituating, reciting classical tragedy in the pandemic. It's literature, in your account, becomes a place where temporalities collide. Your book very much owns the provocation of anachronism, right? Which is a recurrent theme in your work, whether it's in archive feelings or your book on Aristophanes' resistant form. You deliberately choose critical theory and formalism over historicism and excavation. And by critical theory, I, I mean that in the larger sense, there's a real strain of black radical thought in your chapters as well. Um, so your book isn't a case for how Greek tragedy helps us master the present, but how it confronts us with forms of undoing, excess, extraction, ruination, and also insurrection, relationality, and non-hierarchical conceptions of care that open up different futures or avenir. So just to give the audience a sense of the structure of the book, there are four parts. The first is air, time, and faces, and it reads congestion and contagion, the kind of contagion we all experience during COVID through the miasma of Oedipus Rex, which you call the pandemic play par excellence, right? And the sense of excessive and arrested time. Part two is titled Communities um, and ex it examines the possibility of non-hierarchical caregiving and solidarity um, in a play like The Supplicant Women, but also looks at the toxicity of heterosexual domestic life in Alcestis. Part three actually looks at ruins and consider tra tragedy and climate change in relation to racial violence. And you have this gorgeous reading of Antigone's cave as a site of deep time that lies beyond extraction and extinction. And Part four on breath and insurrection looks at protest and its suppression. And this is a really interesting chapter in which uh, section, one of the chapters turns to Akram Khan's um, Zen, a dance performance, a Kathak dance performance about Indian colonial soldiers in World War I that you read through Prometheus, but also through the black abolitionist tradition and through Fanon and other figures you bring into this conversation are Toni Morrison, Saidia Hartman, Du Bois and so forth. And so um, as I close, I just wanted to uh, read out the last uh, sentence of your book, which I think really um, illustrates what you mean by reading through pandemic times. And it is to reimmerse oneself affectively and interpretively in the contagious oversaturation of Greek tragedy is to breathe the sensations of this pandemic a curdled, clinging aggravation that, densifying the atmosphere, portends not a singular storm-beaten whirlwind, and I think that's Aeschylus, mm -hmm. is it? Um, but a proliferating, unbound agitation, a force of de-individuation that confounds the homogenization of time, never ceasing to bristle the air. So thank you for this beautiful book. And I just wanted to for us to be in conversation before we open up the chat to...
uh, the public. Um, so, hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm speechless. Okay. I wish you had written my book, actually. Because, <laughs> you know, that is so much the better. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's an advantage for me, you know. <laughs> I mean, be, coming to classics through, you know, defamiliarized, deterritorialized perspective. That's what I meant, which is what I try to do. Right. Thanks to the Berkeley community, I would say. Thanks to your work, thanks to Steven's work, thanks to Michael's work, Karen, um, uh, Elisa, Niklaus, all of you. Really, this is the product of this community that has made me, I would say, a different scholar. Mm. Uh, so I would say that this is a book that is the product of a, a, a way of seeing literature in its connections with critical theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I... I guess one question, and I think yes. we've had this conversation before. I mean, you have, you know, Aristophanes and the comedy of crisis here, and then you also have Greek tragedy in a global crisis. And I'm, I'm really interested in the term crisis, which is, you know, I mean, we talk about crisis, you know, refugee crisis, COVID crisis. So I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what's drawing you to that term. Well, um, I would say that... Uh, what I'm trying to do in the book by mobilizing all these texts, all these thinkers, is to create a sense of overdetermined reading, which is in keeping with the sense of an overdetermined crisis, which we are dealing with right now. Crisis is no longer, you know, a parenthesis, an individual moment, the state of emergency that can be addressed and that can be addressed with judgment which of course is the etymological meaning of the word crisis but it's a kind of endless dilation right there is a sense of an opaque crisis with the stasis of a continuing crisis as joseph osmondson says in his book on virology or something like what I think Baudrillard calls a catastrophe in slow motion. Mm. So how can we translate that sense of crisis into a practice of reading? And so my answer is to focus on the untimeliness of tragedy and in the possibility of seeing you know, individual moments in this play as overlapping with crises of the present. You know, so for example, in the chapter on Prometheus and the Akran Kams video, that performance, the hand buried in the sand evokes the mass grave in Ukraine, but also that uh, uh, famous picture of David Wojnarowicz, you know, called Untitled, a, a, which is basically a buried head, uh, which is an evocation of AIDS. So there is this sense, as I said, of uh, overdeterminacy, of crises shading into each other through the process of reading, which really produces this sense of oversaturation of uh, um, an ontological, ontological in the Derridian sense, heaviness, which I try to capture in this practice of what I swear I call radical formalism. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about uh, anachronistic provocations, and uh, I like both terms. I like the term provocation, you know, in the sense that uh, I think that tragedy issues a call, right? Provocation. It uh, challenges us to produce models of reading that can lead us to formulate genuine relations of in betweenness between the text and the interpreter. So, I don't believe that the interpreter can entirely detach herself from the reading of a text like tragedy, which has been called a closed text. That is a text that does not refer to its topical context, 
you know, it's a, it's a, a discussion of myth. So there is a kind of closeness which can also become an opening in the sense that every reader, you know, necessarily brings part of themselves, you know, in the process of reading. But there is a tendency, you know, I would say in classical scholarship, which is absolutely understandable to privilege, you know, the original condition of production and of reception of these texts, you know, as the main target of the interpretive act. So I'm not saying that uh, classical scholars who are reading tragedy do not recognize their own situatedness when they interpret the text, but my impression is that, situ that situatedness is not usually turned into a generative uh, um, element uh, for the purposes of the interpretation. That's why I talked about relations of in-betweenness. Mm -hmm. So I want the interpreter to put herself into the interpretive act, not because I think that the interpreter can impose themselves on it, but because I think that there is a phenomenon of interobjective dispossession, deterritorialization that emerges in the contact between interpreter and text if the interpreter is willing, mm -hmm. you know, to make their situatedness central to the interpretive act, as opposed to just recognizing it as a form of caveat and then still thinking of fifth century Athens as the exclusive of main or main frame of reference. So when, as we're so, reading you, we're also reading Mario reading. Right, I would say so. Yeah. Mario, you know, with, uh, you know, all his neuroses, you know, living in this time, living in the pandemic. So I really don't believe that we can or we should even, you know, seal off mm -hmm. that background and just say, okay, you know, I'm a person interpreting in this moment, but still my purpose is to restore the ancient text to a kind of wholeness right. which corresponds you know to the ancient wholeness because that means you know putting the ancient text in a case okay. in a museum and establishing a kind of hierarchy between contexts that are worth pursuing you know as co context of reception and others that consequently are subordinated to mm -hmm. it. And so it's an attempt to bridge the gap, I would say, between the reading of the ancient text and what is called reception, and also bridging the gap between scholarship and forms of creative engagements with tragedy, I would say. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did mention, I did start with the fact that this was actually a theory of reading. Um, to an extent, which, which, yes. Which it is. And I'm wondering, so, I mean, I'm looking again, so reading through pandemic times, um, so much of what you do is really think about temporality in, in these recursive and entangled ways, right? Um, which is of a piece with your um, um, desire to not musealize, as it were, uh, the the tragic text in its initial context of production. Right? So it's reading pandemically precisely because the pandemic has created that kind of uh, instability of time. It created a sensation of acrony. So the pandemic for me is first and foremost the time of the lockdown. So, I mean, most of these readings were conceived during the lockdown. So during a time where the distinction, as many people have suggested, between present, past, and future becomes really difficult to maintain. You know, there is a kind of connection between the loss of taste and smell that some people have perceived and this idea, this sensation of acrony, right? You know, if you think about losing the sense of smell, that means, you know, losing the sense of the event that produces the sensation, losing the sense of what creates a before and the after in the emergence of sensation. And that as a counterpart, you know, in this collapse 
of uh, uh, temporal uh, regimes of chronicities. So in a sense, this way of reading enacts the very temporality of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't help but ask you, I mean, because you, you do actually talk about how the, the pandemic, I mean, your, your, your book is so wide ranging, it, it really does roam into so many different times and, and spaces. Um, and this was happening to you as you were in lockdown, right. right? So I just wondered if you wanted to share a little bit the experience of going back to these um, tragic texts in lockdown and, and having that experience of that expansive experience of both spatial and temporal. Well, I must say that, uh, I, I mean, being sincere here, I did not dislike the lockdown, I know. you know, <laughs> as uh, my closest friends know, <laughs> you know, and uh, that was uh, a revelatory moment, you know, for me and my partner who remained in the house without ever leaving ever for a year and a half. And you know that this is true that I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> and the thing is that we didn't hate that. <laughs> we actually we actually thought that that was quite pleasant, that was quite soothing. Uh, so that was also a moment in which we had to reckon with our, I can say, neurodiversity, I would say. So that the pandemic also became a kind of... Uh, a um, moment of self-diagnosis, right? And uh, um, it became an opportunity also to think about ways of relating with others without presence, right? So I don't think that I can say I com isolated myself entirely from the world. I was still talking to a lot of people and texting and Zooming and talking on the phone and uh, not meeting in present in the presence was not an obstacle so that's why for i guess when i read the scholarship on the pandemic and as you know every major theorist has written you know a book on you know, the pandemic which actually we read in my uh, in the current rhetoric course that i'm teaching at the moment i guess initially i was really sympathetic with Zizek's mm. position which we saw the pandemic as a possibility of radical change, you know, thinking in particular, well, we know that that's, that was not the case because, you know, I was, you know, uh, enjoying my privilege, you know, as a tenured the white professor, you know, and I had the opportunity to stay inside and not working and not going to campus, but we know that there were people who never had the opportunity, not even during the lockdown, to stop working. But Zizek makes the point, made the point in his first book on the pandemic, of course, he published other two after that one, you know, that uh, um, this could be a way for thinking about interruptions of capitalism. Mm. So for example, you know that uh, uh, like the, the, the governor or lieutenant governor of Texas, you know, Greg Abbott, and also Ron Johnson said, we, we really need to get the, the economy going. And if some lives have to be sacrificed, so be it. So that really evinced a kind of sense, you know, of fear on the part of capitalists that, uh, you know, the economic, the financial status quo was reaching a moment of profound crisis of stalling. So I guess the pandemic for me was an opportunity to think about ways in which even the very idea of work could be redefined, reimagined through forms of temporal brokenness, through forms of interruption, through forms of discontinuity. Uh, that's why, why, for example, I, I reread Katie Week's book on no work theory and Michael Art and, and Negri's book on empire, where they really talk about labor and so forth. But I know that that was an utopian scenario, a uh, Zizekian scenario. Still, there are um, specific cases that we are an analyzing in my current course uh, in which the pandemic seemed to have uh, 
produce some kind of political change. Mm. For example, we read an article which was just published in the Comparatist about the implementation of COVID policies in China. And of course, we know that China had very strict, you know, regulations about the pandemic. But these social scientists make the argument that actually the implementation of those policies at the local level actually, you know, contradicted some of uh, the instructions coming from the central government. So there was paradoxical the emergence of some peripheral forms of government or some forms of uh, mass uh, grassroots movement in the periphery, you know, which created a kind of alternative government to the central one in China. So right. it's just a small and uh, example of uh, um, how perhaps the pandemic had the ability to change a few things, at least for some people. And you've kind of addressed the, 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 the moments, the potential for insurrection or change through Prometheus right. in your book, right? And, um, and I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit yeah, about that. Yeah, through the Accra Khan yeah. performance, which actually was, you know, took place here at Berkeley. Um, I focus on a digital mm -hmm. version of that uh, uh, performance. And uh, uh, I wrote the chapter just after the George Floyd uh, murder. And uh, so that chapter is my discussion of uh, I Can't Breathe in relation to the emphasis on breath uh, and breathlessness that is a very important thematic issue in tragedy. I mean, in, in their book on the pandemic, uh, Judy Butler refers to this treatise by Max Scheler, who says that uh, um, the tragic is really the mode in which the world manifests itself through heavy breath. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that performance, that production of Prometheus, the movement, the spinning movement of the colonized soldier is not just an expression of the colonial symbolics imperative to keep going, to never stop working, but it also becomes a kind of uh, um, breathlessness, continuing breathlessness, which is also a way to, as Angela Davis would put it, prolong the intensity of the individual moment of insurrection into an aftermath. Mm -hmm. And that is in contrast. I mean, so because you're also um, drawing an analogy between, is it Aeschylus's prose? Uh, Aeschylus, with poetry, right? Tuck, uh, so Prometheus Tuck, right? is on stage for the old play, right? He has to keep talking. So there is a kind of dramaturgical sadism there, right? Prometheus is punished, is, uh, you know, uh, attached to the rock, you know, and he has to keep talking like this. So there is a sadistic element, but if you consider, you know, the form of this poetry, if you perform the kind of hyperformalistic analysis mm -hmm. that I do, you can see the language at a certain point becomes a sprawling wave of phonemes, yeah. which uh, pushes back against, you know, language as a kind of cutting, which I connect with Fanon's idea of colonization as a contraction of one's infinitude. So there is a kind of infinite going that, uh, you know, this, sway, this wave of phonemes uh, sort of figure as opposed to the cutting force of punctuation mm -hmm. and uh, basically against the distribution of the sensible that language is, which doesn't do anything else but dividing, you know, a sequence of phonemes into structures, into sequences uh, of signifying words. Mm -hmm. um, and I also connect that with the kind of glitchy effect of the digital, since, you know, this is uh, a performance that was uh, digitalized. Okay, yeah. 
So it's interesting. So the sonic and the kinetic here. Yeah, and the sonic, are... the kinetic, and the digital kinetic, yeah, com sort of converge. So I'm aware that time is a flying, and so I wanted to open if I have lots more questions Great. And, and comments, but um, if there are questions from the audience. Dora. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I haven't had a chance to read your book, Mario, yet. So well, I taught my last class today. So no, you don't have to. <laughs> um, but thank uh, you for coming, by the way. So uh, you might address this in your book, but I'm just curious um, what you make of the turn to Greek tragedy in um, during the pandemic. That so many people. There yeah. were so many Zoom productions, you know, um, there was that long piece by Elise Bachiman in the- I like, In fact, I want to talk about that one. Right. So, like, why why the turn to Greek tragedy um, at that moment? Right. So, um, yeah, actually, I have a discussion of that article in the New York Times, in, in the New Yorker or in the New York Times, you know, by Elise Bachiman, whose title was How Greek Tragedy Can Get us through the pandemic and i really contest that because that suggests you know that the tragedy can help us you know reach a return to normalcy right well for me tragedy does the opposite and that's precisely why we should be interested in it but you know we should not try to go back to normal we should not try, and it's impossible also to achieve that, but we should not try to achieve, to, to go back to the way things were before the pandemic, because the way things were before are not particularly satisfactory, because of course the pandemic, as you said, became, it wasn't just a, a concrete thing, but it was also a metaphor. So during the pandemic, racism really appeared to be a kind of viral disease, right? Probably more than it ever was before. So uh, there is a kind of cathartic, and I guess I go back to my previous book, there is a kind of cathartic reading of tragedy that uh, people cannot really let go of. And uh, this idea of seeing it as therapeutic and uh, um, I contest that precisely because I read catharsis not as uh, the fulfillment of a return, a return to the state of no excitation that preceded, you know, the excitation of the tragic spectacle. But it's a kind of loop, like you try to return to the way things were before, but you can't. <laughs> and consequently, this restoration that is never achieved creates this kind of Jewish son mechanism, which is not therapeutic and obviously which is the opposite of uh, a, a liberal fetishization of normalcy. So I was going to ask you a little bit about the place of philology in your work, because uh -huh. I know that one of the things that is vexatious to more conventional um, a scholarship on on these texts um, is that you're you're very, very steeped in the specificity of language in, in a lot of your moves. And yet you're also developing a completely different framework of reading from a kind of conventional philological approach. So I'm, I'm just curious to hear you think about the role of a certain mastery of, say, ancient Greek in a project that is openly, provocatively anachronistic. That's great. So yes, it's philological, but I would say in the etymological sense of the word, that is to say, I perform a kind of love for language which means a kind of catexis to language, a kind of erotic attachment 
to language, not just language, but the individual phonemes. And so um, it's not philological in the sense that I'm not trying to restore an intention, but it is to the extent that I develop a kind of uh, um, intimate connection with language as such, right? Uh, these are the most uh, erotic engagements with language and with its resonances, not just with language, but with the sonic, or as uh, my colleague Fumio Kiji would put it, with the infrasonic, right? And so it is, I would say, hyperphilological, or it's a kind of oversensitive reading, which is, uh, you know, a, a formulation that uh, some people, it's a kind of overanalysis or too, too close reading, as D.A. Miller would put it, or oversensitive reading, which of course is a phrase I particularly like, precisely because I've been, and I'm still categorized as oversensitive or hypersensitive, and of course uh, it's a very uh, queer term or used for queers. So I would say it's a kind of oversensitive philology, which uh, philologists do not like. And uh, um, I take that challenge, you know, I actually am against the logic of I don't buy that, which is still part of the epistemology of classics. You know, when you give a paper, you know, some people say, I don't buy that. And I really, <laughs> that's something that actually Mel Chen is dis discusses, you know, for pages in their new book on intoxication. They have a great discussion of this formula, I don't buy it. And they're saying, I'm not selling anything. I don't, I don't want to persuade you of anything. Because, you know, persuade you of something means that there is some kind of hidden truth that needs to be brought to the surface, right? I mean, the rhetoric of I don't buy it presupposes a kind of axiology of plausibilities and implausibilities. But that plausibility is always related to what? We are going back to authorial intention, to some kind, you know, of normative limit, you know, for interpretation. And uh, I guess I reject that. The economy versus phonemic infinitude. Right, exactly. Hi, Maria. Hi, Elisa. Just a, a simple question. So I, oh, maybe it's not so simple. I, I, I'm fascinated by this idea of you know crisis, defining the crisis. We talk about permanent crisis, crisis is ongoing, that catastrophe in slow motion. You were defining tragedy or the way we normally see tragedy as a closed form. Yeah. At what point does studying tragedy or thinking through tragedy help us redefine our sense of crisis? In other words, <laughs> how do we know if we are no longer in a crisis, but actually in the midst of a tragedy? I mean, is this, are these tragic times? Or is it just simply a, a kind of permanent crisis? At what point is there uh, a sense of fatality, ultimate fatality to it, in a way that we only find within a tragic mode? So thank you. That's brilliant. So um, when you say, uh, when do we realize that we are in a tragedy? Do you mean a tragedy in the sense of a play? That is to say something that has a beginning and an end? Something like a sense of a kind of end game, right? So sort of finality or closed forms rather than a sense of well, I, that's a kind of an ongoing that, that unfolding. That. I think that in tragedy you have this sense that also the pandemic has provoked that there will be soon the end. If you think of the Californian wildfires, well, that's another thing I talked about, the Californian wildfires, mm -hmm. right? when the sky became red or when the sky became yellow, that is a kind of materialization of the end of the world. And so there is a sense, uh, um, a frightening sense that we are reaching the end or also a liberatory sense. 
<laughs> that we are reaching the end. But for me, uh, I would say the tragic is really about this back and forth between the appearance of that kind of disruptive uh, imminence, the imminence of the end of the world, and on the other hand, the realization that nothing is changing, that nothing has changed, that we are still stuck, the end of the world is not coming. So it's about this, you know, fort and da between these two scenarios, which I think, you know, the lockdown sort of, uh, you know, um, put, put on our skin. So you mentioned it earlier, and as we all know, Chinese government implemented a very strict lockdown policy. And I'm sure before writing this book, you must have done like tons of research on pandemic and also lockdown policies in other countries. Uh, maybe like not as much as I would have liked to. I must so, confess. Yeah. Uh, just uh, simply out of curiosity, what do you think about the uh, lockdown policy in China? And would you see this policy, this very strict lockdown policy, is a tragedy for Chinese people? Well, uh, there was a, a strong element of surveillance, obviously, um, which is something that some scholars have talked about. Um, you know, that's basic, that kind of surveillance is what uh, made George Agamben lose his mind, right? Because, you know, he identified the old, you know, pandemic with that scenario, because for him, it was just irresistible, you know to see something like a pandemic, which is a perfect example of the state of emergency. So, yeah, so I, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm not entirely comfortable with those forms, <laughs> like no one else is, uh, with those forms of surveillance. But as I mentioned before, there is also evidence that that system of implementation that seems so rigid actually reached some moments of stalling precisely because the pandemic was really the Deridian event that is something that we can't in any way grasp and consequently you know was able to disrupt and produces produce moments of disidentification even in a system as rigid and hierarchical as the Chinese one. I can't resist the question, so uh, how does it relate to the comical in the sense of, I mean, it, during it, I find it very, very interesting here too, I mean, obviously the pandemic, the, tra the tragedy and the tragedy as a place to go, and in, in a way, the way you read it, yeah, not as a resolution, not as a manual how to deal with it, but as producing that kind of uh, suspended state, also suspended suspension of hermeneutics, etc. But there's the other famous text of Boccaccio's De Cameron dealing with the with the plague, so to speak, not really mm -hmm. dealing with the plague, but engaged in a situational way with the plague. And I just think of like the role of the of the, the comic comical or the it's also not the right to call Boccaccio's De Cameron as a comical mm -hmm. really, but a different comedy is way. never just like comedy. No. Right. So anyway, what, or at least that's not how I read it. Yeah. Thoughts on that relation, which seems to be, yeah, so foreign to the tragic model. You were talking about. I would say they have in common a sense of discomfort, right? Think about what Berlin says about the comic, right? Which is uh, about the funny, but also about the not funny. A sense of discomfort, a sense of awkwardness at the end of the day. So I would, I see the possibility of connecting the comedy with the pandemic in their light. This is kind of a follow-up question to where Michael was going earlier. 
with respect to philology. Yes. I would be interested in hearing you say a little bit about historicism, um, in addition to being manically philological in some respects, classical studies and allied arenas, ancient studies tend to be very decidedly historicist in some mm -hmm. motivations and inclinations. And yet you spoke very interestingly and movingly about transformations and reinflections of your own personal sense of temporality, historicity, and your own existential equation, but also how that connects to the larger senses of interruptions and terminations and re-beginnings. Do you think that, that this is going to lead you ultimately to some kind of re, uh, revalued historicism or a post-historicist? I like the term post-historicism. Yeah. I, I mean, I really would like to have a conversation with you about that. Uh, so all my classicists are not in this room or traditional classicists have, traditional classicists have left. <laughs> so we can, we can, uh, you know, uh, talk, you know, we can, now we can talk. Yes, it's a big problem of that discipline. And uh, I, I have struggled with it. And uh, um, what can I say? Um, it's very stifling. Um, and that's why, you know, a certain kind of traditional classical scholarship sort of uh, repeats itself constantly, uh, produces very derivative products. And, um, and that's a kind of death drive, in my, in my opinion. It, I mean, there is a kind of perverse pleasure in doing in doing that, uh, and it's not easy to break with that. You know, you have to change department in order to do it. <laughs> um, but uh, what do you mean by post historic? Do you think you would you characterize what I'm doing as post historicism in the sense that it's still philological, but it's still a kind of anchoring within? you know, the particularities of the language, right? Exactly, it is. You mean reception? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's uh, um, the kind of uh, reception that is done in classics is still operating under traditional epistemic paradigms of classical historicism. That's why, you know, I try to bridge the gap between reception and uh, I don't know how to call it the study of the text of the I don't want to say the word original but you know what I what I mean and also I um I also want to move scholarship closer to forms of creative writing I know that that is uh, dangerous and controversial in some respects but I think it's a risk that we have to to start taking. Thank you both so much, Amari. I want to ask you about the um, about the affective cast of the gestures you're pointing to, and they're familiar critical theory gestures in certain respects. Yes, you you know the glimpse of another possibility. In your case, the you know the possibility of non-restoration of the normal, or of a different temporality, or you know the example of the Chinese marginal peripheral you know emergence of different kinds of government, or uh, you know more uh, local, sort of holding that space open for the pandemic time, not just what was, and the gestural element, you know that I'm hearing about, and it's. it's just one of my questions for critical theory too is it can it, it is a hope on the one hand like you're holding open hope but is it also in a way a proleptic nostalgia like oh it's so nice here at home you know we're not going anywhere and you know it's gonna end 
And so there's a nostalgia sort of, oh, can't we just hold it open a little longer? Can't we somehow put in the center this like marginal phenomenon of pandemic time and, you know, whatever other, the, 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 the non-fetishization of the normal and things that you referred to there. Like, how do you see that affective part? I mean, this isn't just for you, it's critical theory. It's hope, yes, but it's also kind of, is it, I'm asking, holding on to something that cannot really remain? I mean, we cannot remain in infinite suspension or infinite marginality. No, we can't, but we can bring that suspension into our lives to an extent, right? We can have those moments, you know, of interruption, of discontinuity. I mean, it has happened, de facto. People are meeting through, on Zoom, which would not have happened without the pandemic. So the very texture of work has changed. Smart working, well, I don't know why it's called smart working, but teleworking is a thing, right? So I think that, you know, having more of those interruptive moments could be not just a utopia or a hope, but they have to say a real possibility. Although even, I mean, these examples are all yeah. recuperations of capital, right? Yeah. Great. You know? well. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, I mean, you know, Jameson or Zizek, I don't remember who said that, that it's easier to reach the end of the world than to reach the Imagine. end of capital, right? So there are more questions. Steven, Ramona? We have to close. No, 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 no. I mean, I don't even know that I, uh, I, huh? I don't even know that I have like a, I, I, I love the I don't buy it moment, right? Like, well, not love it as a statement, but like just making it plain. I mean, so, can we, what does it mean really? What do you think it means? Well, well, white? that's exactly what I was like, I was trying to think through here, right? So it's like, um, there's the need, the demand for explanation, laying it, right. making it plain, laying it out. Right. There's explication, like our relationship to the text is that we're going to just like peel away the layers to reveal something. So I'm trying to figure out what we would name like the alternative to that. Do you know what the I mean? Alternative the alternative to, to explanation, the alternative to explication. I, I've been sitting here thinking, you you know, so, I haven't read the book yet, but the sonic is sort of seems to be really important. Yeah. And sort of in sound studies, the idea of like contextualization, like that you hear a sound differently. You don't you're not forcing anyone to hear a sound, but you're creating a kind of, I don't know, like a atmosphere so that you hear it differently. So I, I'm trying I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering what we would call it or like. I mean, you can call it philology to an extent. You can call it philology. Like in this kind of... Uh, um, a phonemic philology. A phonemic philology or mm -hmm. dispossessive philology also. Because, you know, I think that the vortex, the interpretive vortex is, I think, an important metaphor for me, right? There is kind of an effect of spiral in these kind of uh, readings in which you focus on detail, uh, which nobody else focuses because we think they are unimportant or unmarked and uh, uh, you then connect them with their metapolitical implications you know that's basically the move that I always adopt in my scholarship like you know a moment of connection or weird connection with uh, um, a localized effect of reading and then I see the metapolitical implications of that um but the alternative, I mean, when you when you like a paper, right? I personally, I like it not because I buy the thesis, but because I think it's interesting, because it tells me something I did not see, right? And I think that there, I mean, we are all we all agree on that in principle. But then when you hear, you know, on you know, we are on both on representations, you know, we so we know how things go. That I don't buy reemerges constantly, which in a sense is the death drive of intentionality, which is a kind of origin that you always go back to. Um, but we are over time, but Mario, thank you so much for writing thank the book. Thank you. And, and thank you. Of our team.